Welcome back to Unbreakable, a mental health podcast with Jay Glazer. And before I get to my guest, who has a huge week ahead of him, if you're like many people, you may be surprised to learn that one in five adults in this country experienced mental illness last year. Yet far too many fellow receive the support they need. Carol on Behavioral Health is doing something about it. They understand that behavioral health is a key part of whole health, delivering compassionate care that treats physical, mental, emotional, and social needs in tandem. Carol Lynn Behavioral Health, raising the quality of life through empathy and action. So welcome into Unbreakable, a mental health podcast. And the guest I have this week, you think there's twins, Rhonda and Tiki Barber. There's, there's actually three of us. Jake Laser is part of the, the family as well. And man, what a huge week it is for my brother, Rhonda Barber, Hall of Famer, Rhonda Barber, going to Canton, Ohio this week for that Hall of Fame. How we doing, buddy? Uh, be better in about, uh, let's say seven days when all this is done. Wait, you have nerves? You never have nerves. No, not nerves. It's just a lot. You know how it is. You've been through this <laughs> with some of your boys before. Uh, there's a lot going on. 400 plus people showing up for us, dude. That's, wow. thank God I have uh, a loving and uh, busybody wife that <laughs> has, has had no problems taking on all of this because I definitely would have been able to do what she's done. Uh, to get us ready, but I'm I'm excited for it. I'm ready for it. Yes, you know what he's talking about there. Um, Claudia, his wife, uh, he has 400 people coming, and several of his friends are children like me. So I hit her up, and I was like, "Hey, Claudia, you know my tickets, my like, what do I do?" And she's like, "Oh, you got everything sent in in the email." I'm like, "Claudia, I'm a child. I don't know how to do things for myself." So she held my hand and made sure everything was set. You got 400 friends like that. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of I got a lot of those. You're, I think you were probably the last one that she had. To talk to. Uh, you're you're like the guy that uh, shows up for the wedding and is like, "Oh, we were supposed to RSVP for that." Uh, sorry, I don't have to see for you. And I'm the gift. Yeah, you are the gift. <laughs> when they so, given. Here's what I want people to know, and I don't know if Rondé knows this part, but listen, he has a record for most consecutive. Starts ever by a DB, played 16 years, three-time All-Pro, which means you're the best at your position, two-time second-team All-Pro, five-time Pro Bowler, all-decade team for 2000s, has Jersey retired from college, Super Bowl champion, Hall of Famer. But I don't know if you know this. Rondé Barber is the first person I ever called, <laughs> not to get choked up here, that I ever called, ever, when I was struggling and told them and tell people this, man, lean into your friends and your teammates. This was the Tampa Super Bowl a couple years ago. Myself and him and my friend Brian and Ben asked them to go to do dinner. And they said, now we're all busy. And I said, no, dude, I need to have dinner. I'm struggling. And my dude was there for me. Always <laughs> there for you, Jay. I mean, you were there for me back when I was a nobody. I, I, people don't know that. that there was a time when it was Tiki in New York and Rondé was a, I don't know what I was back then, uh, but we became friends back then. And that was, 20, let's, let's put 25 years on that. I think right. that at least 25 years ago. And uh, so yeah. it, it, one thing that I can provide uh, for you and for all my friends, uh, but especially you, because we've been through so much, it, I know what your life journey has been. I've been through a lot of it um, uh, from afar here recently, but I was there at the beginning when you were trying to make it. And, and, you, and then you make it, you have such this profound influence on the world of sport. And at the end of the day, people don't know you're struggling. So if you ask me for that, I will absolutely be there. And I know that I have a very positive outlook on life. Um, I, I feel like I haven't had many bad days. I've had some. I feel like I haven't had many bad days. But if I can light, lighten up your life and let you know how much you're loved, brother, you can call me anytime. And and here's the thing, folks. That was the first time I ever, like, I never said anything straight. I never said anything at The Rock, really. I never, you know, my best friends, I never said anything. Had Rondé and them said, no, no, we're busy. Man, I don't know if I would have opened up to the world and had this, you know, God for everybody else to be able to lean into your friends and your teammates, but because you said, Oh, you know, first, Oh, I'm busy. Then, Oh, you're struggling. I'm there. It allowed me to teach everybody else. This is what happens when you lean into your crew. They respond. They're there for you. 
And that just started the most incredible chain reaction for, I think, a lot of us, brother. I, well, there's also the fact that, you know, my friends have always been there for me, too. So and I, when Brian and Ben, nobody in the world knows who those guys are, but we do. Right. Uh, th- those guys, uh, there has been as solid for me as I could possibly expect uh, from, you know, two guys that I met as an adult. Um, and granted, we met as an adult, too. It's not like, you know, not, eh, Jay, kind of. not, as, not, as, not as if Jay was actually born out of the room <laughs> of Geraldine Barber. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the companionship and the, uh, you know, the love that has been fostered through all, all of our years, I got that later with those guys. And those guys, because they love me, love you. Uh, and I, I, I swear, I think back to that night sometimes and, uh, and I'm thankful, um, for, you know, that family extends itself because not a lot of people have families, you know, close enough families that they can go to, but um, everybody should have that extension of family, uh, that you can always rely on. And I've always had that and I'll always be that for you, man. That's a Hall of Fame friend because folks, I was struggling, right? And you, and I've always put on this face and he's known the glaze and all that stuff. And, um, Oh yeah, you're a whole hell of a lot of fun when it's all good, dude. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, but but it's oh, it's rarely good between my ears, and I'd go overboard for it. So I always created that character. And the first time I'd be like, "Hey, um, man, I, that's just character. This really what's going on." And that was a huge moment for my life, man. Really, really big. So I want to, you know, I want people to understand the mastery of Rondé Barber. And when I say this, uh, there's a couple things. Hey, and I always tell my I used to tell my fighters and I always tell players, man, it's your honor to play hurt. And one of the guys I learned that from is Rondé. And it doesn't mean look at it. I always tell guys, hey, you don't show it, you don't show it. Now in life, I want everybody to show where our struggles are and open up. But you didn't miss a game. You have the, the record for most consecutive games ever started as a defensive back. But it's not like you weren't injured, right? So first of all, list list off the injuries you play through. Okay. I love this. Uh, and uh I wrote and- about it in my book. Right. And well, it started in high school. I can go all the way back to high school. And a lot of this was, uh, to be honest with you, just in an effort to keep up with the twin. Right. Because in high school, I broke my collarbone. Uh, second game of our senior season, senior season. Right. It's last time I'm going to play high school with all the friends you grew up with. Broke my collarbone and it was probably a month injury. I missed like two weeks and came back and played. And I think that was the start of the you know, I'm going to do this regardless type of thing. Give me an opportunity to play, and I'm not ever going to leave. So from there. Uh, Wait, did, they, did they put a plate in it, or did they just heal it? Oh, uh, they just set it. They didn't even, they didn't. Wow. They okay. just set it. And just, you know, and then I put that, put that thing. I don't know if you ever broke your collarbone. Anybody out oh. there has ever broke that collarbone. They put that thing on your back that pulls your shoulders to set your collarbone. And uh, two weeks later, I said, the hell with it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go play. But yeah, the list. Here we go. So this is a lot. See if I can remember them all it's sequentially. So it's gangster broke- shit, folks. It's gangster <laughs> shit. <laughs> so in college, uh, I had a stress fracture of my foot that ended up breaking, but I played through it for like the last four or five games uh, of of my redshirt freshman year. Then before the my third season playing at Virginia, I dislocated my elbow, compound dislocation. Uh, and they had to have surgery in the off season. I played with that like three months later no, uh, to start that next season. But then we get to the, the NFL. And, man, it, besides this, I'm not going to even mention the soft tissue injuries, the pulled hamstrings and the quads. That those those mean nothing. But I had a high ankle sprain in 98 that I played and, through. And never missed a game, folks, through all this. Go ahead. High ankle sprain in 98 that I played through. Uh, it may have been 99. Um, in uh, 2001, um, uh, or I'm sorry, 2002, I broke my thumb, uh, during, during, during a game, played through it and then had surgery, played the next week. That same year, I tore my PCL in the back of my right knee, uh, also Super Bowl year. So I was not going to not play. So I played through that, had surgery and that bothered me for probably the next four or five years of my career. Uh, I, uh, uh, uh shattered my form. Uh, in a in a game in 2011. Uh, what else? What, what was the other one? Um, a tore a tore meniscus in my left knee, the other knee from my PCL uh, that I played through, um, probably in 2006 or seven. And it just, it just it couldn't stop. I couldn't stop playing. Like if I if I was able to walk, I was going to play. And if it was an upper body injury, I was going to definitely play. Um, I think my foot would have had to fall off for me to actually not not play. 
Uh, is this something you were taught or is it just because you said, well, I wanted to keep up. I was a twin and I didn't want to fall behind Tiki. Well, a little bit of that, but I think mostly um, to be real honest, I got on the field in high school and in the pros because somebody got hurt. Somebody got hurt. It gave me an opportunity to play and I never stopped playing from, from then on out. And so it was this, um, I, I, I've used it, this term, like this fear of failure, but really it was like a fear of somebody else, you know, getting an opportunity that I thought that I, that I worked hard to, to get. And I didn't want, I didn't want to give anybody else that opportunity. And that's selfish to, to a degree, but, uh, no, it's, it's not, also, yeah, that's but, not yeah. selfish at all. <laughs> but, but, it, but, it, but it also, it, drive. yeah, it also helped drive a mentality that allowed me to be great, you know, cause if, if I'm not, if I'm not a hundred percent and I'm still performing, then when I am a hundred percent, I'm going to be really, really good. And, um, I, I don't know. It just, it just stuck with me. And I, I don't know. I think people doubted me for so long early in my career that, um, I think there was a sense that I had, I had to prove them wrong mm-hmm. and being hurt didn't give me the opportunity to prove them wrong. So I just chose not to be hurt. <laughs> so I'll tell you a mastery of Ronnie Barber. He and I are sitting in a, bar in New York. We're watching Monday Night Football and Washington's playing Dallas. And all of a sudden, Rondé says, oh, this will be a, a eight-yard in to Lavernius Coles. Still remember the player. Right. <laughs> sure as shit, folks, it was an eight-yard in to Lavernius Coles. And I said, how'd you know that? And he just said, well, down in distance, it was, you know, seven yards and third and seven. But you said, on film, I noticed Lavernius, when he's going to be the target, he's about two inches taller or shorter than when he's not the target, or something along those lines. And I'm yeah. like, how the fuck do you see this on film, that tiny little thing? Yeah. You are unreal when it comes to watching film, but seeing those tiny little things. But it's not just you're on film, you're just watching, watching on the game broadcast. Right, it's just, a, it, it's an obsession is what it was. You know, it was a, a, a obsession with detail and perfecting the, the details. I mean, we we can all go out, like you're a fighter, you know, you can all go out and perfect the technique and, and rep, rep, rep the technique uh, that that's going to carry you through uh, a competition. But the mental uh, prep was the same thing for me. It was that little tiny detail. I, I treated it just like practicing my back pedal or practicing my step and kick and man to man coverage or whatever in tackling form. Um, my prep was the exact same. It had to be detail oriented, and it just stuck. It just sticks with you. So if I've seen it on film and I noticed it, and I noted it, then uh, it's going to be there forever. So when we were watching that game, just sitting around and having a, a, more than a few I'm cocktails. Here, yeah. Right. <laughs> more, than a few, more than a few cocktails as we're wont to do. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, oh, okay, this is this is what's getting ready to happen. Uh, let me let me, let me me impress Jay with my uh, with my Yeah, people. and clearly you have because I'm still talking about it and preaching the right. gospel. But how, there's an art to watch and form. You know, I sit there and, you know, Strahan killed my, Social scene because he'd sit there and watch film, watch film, watch film. Like, oh, look, look at this. Look at John Runyon's foot. It's a half an inch tilted in. I'm like, what are you looking at? Man, nobody so, else cares about that, right? <laughs> but also, a lot of guys can't recognize it. They can't sure. see it. So, how did you, did somebody teach you how to watch film or is it just the repetition over the years? Because, folks, I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, when I say, oh, it's two inches or a half an inch and he notices, Something like this in a camera that's way up at the top of the stadium. It's unreal. When you're looking at when you're looking at so much film, like the hours of film that really good players put into it, you notice the the minute details. Uh, like Frank Gore, uh, back when he was playing for San Francisco, and I didn't find this one. Someone else told me this, but this is a good when we were studying him. Somebody else told me this when he was looking uh, to be a pass protector. His head was always moving. He was, he was sur- surveying the field. When he was going to get the ball, his eyes were dead straight. And it, you could always tell. And, it, you know, it, not every play. So he gave away a pass and run on every play. Every, not every play did that, you know, was I able to see that playing corner. But the few times where you're like, oh, wait a minute, let me check his head. And he's like this. You're like, okay, this is a run. And it, it, it just gives you information to get ready for that play. So you can call it cheating. You can call it guessing. Whatever you're not you cheating want. at all. It's, it's, right. you're, you're doing your work. Oh. Right. You're taking advantage Who of. It says it's cheating. Don't call it cheating. It's, right. it's preparation. 
Right. It's taking advantage of knowledge is what it is. When and knowledge and opportunity meet, preparation meet, like you, you go make plays. And I, I I did that pretty well for a long time. And you know, give me give me another one that maybe stand out to me that you're like, oh, when this guy did that, like um, let me think. Well, tell- I could always tell, uh, and this was this was a combination of things. I, and, and not that I ever covered this well, but uh, it was there was a tell between um, Steve Smith and Jake Delone when because you know they ran they, they obviously they were a running team. They had those two great running backs, but they also had a damn good wide receiver, really damn good wide receiver, Hall of Famer in my mind. Uh, that was like a running back, and if the run play was um, going to be covered up by the by the, the call we had on defense, they would just pick up the ball and throw it out there this little now screen, you know, everybody does it now. They call it RPOs now, but back then it was just, he'd pick it up and throw it instead of running into a brick wall in a run game. And Jake DeLome and, and uh, Steve Smith had this, they had this little, I could tell because of the way that Steve Smith was angling his shoulders towards the quarterback. So he had to get ready to catch it. Um, you could tell that the ball was coming and Jake always had, he was like, Jake would be, would look. And if he was like that and he'd give up and throw it. I mean, I missed the tackle a whole bunch of times. <laughs> I guarantee you that I knew every time that that play was coming. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I don't even know if he knew that he did it. Uh, wow. But but I knew that he did it because I needed a little bit of advantage to get that little fucker on the ground. Would you tell your teammates, the offensive guys, how often did you tell them, hey, man, you're you're tipping this? Not very often. I, no. wasn't, I wasn't a sharer. <laughs> you weren't a sharer. <laughs> <laughs> that was I never know if that guy's going to like, – I don't know if uh, if uh, Keenan McCardell or whoever was going to leave and go play for somebody else. I don't need them to know what I know. Okay. Uh, no, right. not, 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 not really. Uh, and I didn't study our guys like I studied other guys. Right. Uh, but um, it, there was, everybody has them. Whether you know it or not, they're there if you look hard enough. It, was it – as you started getting older, and it was funny, you know, Rondé, he'd have this film room, kind of was named the Rondé Barber film room in there, because how much he, you know work he did – yeah. Um, the funny part about that, Jay, is that it was an extra meeting room. It wasn't my room. It was an extra meeting room. We built, went to this new building because before I used to just go into the video room. I'd sit down in the video room at one old one buck, the trailers, and they had this little setup for me where I could just come in, sit down, practice, you know, with my pants, you know, practice gear still on, and just sit there and watch film. We'd shoot the shit, whatever. But then we moved into the new building and they put an extra meeting room down there um, and it, it was unoccupied and I commandeered it. I made it my own and, and put all my shit in there. All my, like, like it was like an extension of my, my locker. Um, I had everything that I needed in there to go in there and watch film. And then I'd, I'd spend hours in there. Um, so go ahead and finish the story. So, <laughs> as guys were coming in and out, you know, I've been with you where people ask you, Hey, you know, what'd you do here? What'd you do for preparation? Did you always offer, teach these young guys, hey, man, come watch film? Or did it also get to the point at one point where, like, hey, I didn't want to do it, so I'm not going to offer it anymore? Did you always do it? No, I always did it. And I tell guys all the time, hey, I'm going to be in here. If you want to come in and watch it, let's go watch. And the one guy that, that really embraced it, I mean, he didn't do it every day with me, was Akeeb. And I got Akeeb really early. Uh, Akeeb to Akeeb leave. Right. Yeah, early in my in his career. Uh, and and I, I think that if you ask him, he'll he'll – to this day, talk about the influence that I had because he was physically gifted, man. I mean, he's long, he's fast, uh, very aggressive, perfect mentality for football. Um, that's why he played so long, was so successful on three or maybe four different teams. Um, but it, it, I, at the very beginning, he was the one guy that I most remember saying, "I'm going to go in and sit down with with, with Rondé mm-hmm. and and figure out what he's looking at," you know, because he obviously by that point I'd been in the league for ten years and. Uh, and he was inquisitive, and and I think uh, some of what I did rubbed off on him. But that was in there every day. I mean, the guys would come in and out, and I'd always tell them to come in. And what I really wanted to do, Jay, was to get them to come in and study themselves. Like it's easy to study your opponent; it's it's easy to look at other people, but to look at yourself critically, that's without a coach telling you, "Hey, you need to do this." Hey, it would be hey, if you have you ever thought about doing this? I want you to do it. I was good because I did it. Um, I went and looked at my footwork and, you know, if I stepped wrong on a, on a, uh, a play in practice, I wanted to know why I did it. So I could go out the very next day and correct it. Uh, and that's, I, I talk about all the time, perfecting your craft. That's, that's what perfecting your craft is. It just doesn't happen 
Like you, you have to know what you're doing wrong to understand what you're doing right. And um, there was there was a lot of guys that actually fell in line with that and got better because of uh, some of my influence in that regard. It's awesome. It also led to you to being the only member and only player in NFL history to have 45 interceptions and 25 sacks. Yeah, You're a group of one, yeah. one of one. Which right. gave you the more more joy? The picks or the sacks? Yeah, the definitely the interceptions, just because they're so hard to come by. I mean, interceptions are not easy. I mean, if you're, oh, you're five foot three like me, sacks right. are way hard to come by for you than picks. But I'll tell you this. <laughs> I'll tell you this, earlier in my career, it was definitely the sacks because that's where I was getting my most opportunities because we, we were blitzing so much. You know, that zone dog mentality that Monty Kiffin and uh, the Eagles uh, defensive coordinator, um, uh, Jim Johnson, Johnson. yeah, had the, those type of D coordinators were just coming into vogue then. And so we did it a lot. And at the time, people didn't really know how to deal with it. And so I had a lot of free runs. But then when they started to pick them up, I had to figure out how to beat the guy that they were signing to block for me. Um, so it, it, to get to 28 sacks is what I ended up with was a pretty special number. I wish it would have, I wish I, I wanted to get the 30, but Shiano made me a safety my last year and didn't play me a nickel. So I didn't get the 30. That's a, that's a different conversation. Um, <laughs> he won't be in the whole face. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, but the interceptions man like the 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 feeling of taking away uh, uh a, a route or a concept that they worked so hard on and that you overplayed and take took the ball away that, that was pretty awesome and um the much, the, the amount of prep to get an interception was like 10 times what it was to get a sack put it that way so uh, the interceptions always felt like more rewarding. Plus, you know, teams trying to score and you get the ball back. I mean, it changed. Those are game changing type plays. I think to me, the, the corners in the league, I mean, safeties too, but the corners in the league that take the ball away, I don't care how good you are technically, the ones that take the ball away are the best players in, in football. Would you have freedom to just go and blitz certain times when you want, or is it always called? Uh, most of them were called. There's a few times where, you know, I had a battle boy kind of sack. I sacked Tony Romo and we played Dallas at home. Um, uh, whatever year that was, it was, it was Raheem's years. And uh, I'm sitting on the end of the line of scrimmage. They had a formation set away from me. So I'm a corner on the end of the line of scrimmage. And I thought it was a run play. And so I was being aggressive playing, supposed to be playing in the flat or whatever. Um, and I just went, I was like, well, I guess, I guess wrong. See if I, could I better myself. get this. I better get him. Let's see if I can make myself right. And uh, and I did. He had no idea I was coming. He turned right around out of this bootleg, and I, and I he had he just went to the ground, got an easy sack. But yeah, like that, that I was supposed to be in coverage, and uh, uh, got a sack out of it. So it, it happened every now and then. Give me a quick one line or a couple lines for the biggest lesson you learned from these names, Tony Dungy. Yeah, Tony Dungy. So Tony. Tony taught me, taught us all, but taught me uh, humility and patience. You know, that you're not always going to be uh, the right away guy. Because uh, I obviously, Tony was my coach my first year in the NFL, and I, I didn't play. I only played in one game. Well, two games. I played in the playoff game, but only one regular season game. Uh, and it was humbling from a guy who, for me, who came from college three time All ACC, had been All American three times. Uh, ACC Rookie of the Year. All I had known was success coming into the league, and the next thing you know, I am like irrelevant as a as a first year player, and that was was humbling. Um, but he always was encouraging, and the way that he handled uh, us as a team, but specifically everybody on the team, not just the Warren Saps and the Derek Brooks and the guys that were really uh, you know challenging uh, being the best players on the team, but the guys that weren't. Uh, it, it, he, he, he helped me understand that I needed to do more. And when I did, I became a really good player. You actually taught me something he taught you also last year at the Hall of Famer, two years ago. He told me he had taught you football's not a career. It's an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That was, that was, yeah. uh, that was, that was, that was, Herm said that to me first, but yes. That oh, it was, was Herm. Uh, okay. Yeah, that was, yeah. uh, My bad. That was one of the first things Herm told you. Told oh. you got got in, and he's like, "And Herm had been there." Right? Oh, you did say Herm. I've been hitting the head a lot too, so I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you did tell me 
And Peyton Manning's Hall of Fame. That part I know. Go ahead. Yes, it's exactly right. Uh, yeah, he first thing he said is like, "Men, it's not. This isn't a. This isn't a career. This is an opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of men that want to do what you're doing right now, and there are a lot that aren't doing it. Are, are you going to do what it takes to become the guy that's, that can make this uh, uh, this opportunity last long? And and, and yeah, that was, it was, those were impactful words because you get in the league, you think that, man, this thing's going to last forever, and you start playing, you think this thing's going to last forever. But in the back of my mind, those words always stayed there. It's just an opportunity, man, and it's not finite. It's going to end, right? It, it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's not infinite. I'm sorry. It's it's finite. It's going to end, and just always knowing that just helps. It helped me probably be the guy that we were talking about earlier. That take your opportunities, your chances to play. Don't give them up, you know, because any one missed game is could be your last. And I wasn't wasn't willing to let that happen. What's the best lesson you learned from Mike Tomlin, who, by the way, folks, when Herm Edwards left, I got calls from Rondé and a bunch of people in there going, man, nobody replace her. No, they got this new guy coming in, Mike Tomlin. No shot, no shot. It took them all about a day going, this dude's unbelievable. <laughs> right. That's, that's a funny story. We, we got it. We get in and it's the off season, right? But I, I got a story about Mike that goes back before he was actually our coach. But I remember the first day of off season work, like the OTAs, they were much longer back then. Now they're like, it's like 11 hours out. three weeks of work in the freaking off season. They don't do anything. But back then we're out first day doing new drills. And I remember Lynch came up to me and said, Rondé, what is up with this dude, man? We're doing <laughs> all these drills that we probably did in college. We don't need to do this stuff. But after like a week, literally everybody's like, okay, I'm getting better. I'm getting better by doing this these minute detailed drills uh, that seem irrelevant at the time. Uh, but it helped, it helped the, that perfection thing. And he was really, really good at like convincing you that it was going to make you a better player. And then obviously it did. Um, but yeah, Mike T, Mike T was the first one. If you're asking for lessons from, from these guys, Mike T was the first guy that uh, offered a mentality adjustment for me. Uh, because I had been successful, right? I I I was a starter at that point. Uh, um, I wasn't very production wise. I wasn't very like I wasn't great. But he saw something in me that he said was going to differentiate me from the crowd, uh, and it was the way that I played inside, played nickel. He's like, I've watched all of your tape. Nobody's doing this, and you're the only person I've ever seen do these reps like this. And he's like, How can we get better? And how can we get you to 20 sacks? And I'm like, I'm not thinking about sacks. I, mean, I only had six interceptions at the time in my career. It was like four years in. I had six interceptions. I'm like, how can I get more interceptions? He's like, dude, we're going to make you a 2020 guy. And I'm like, okay. And we went about to do it. And 12 years later, I was 45, 25 guy. And he got I, you to have confidence in yourself. Yeah, and you yeah, he made me believe. He made me believe that I was on a level that I didn't think that I was on. And, uh, um, it was refreshing because he was really the first guy that gave me that, wow. uh, that empowered me to be the guy that's now about to get a gold jacket. Yeah, no doubt. And he, you yeah, know, there's so many special things about Mike Tomlin. And I think one of the things that's great too, as you said, man, you guys were all complaining that first week. Mike Tomlin could care less what anybody thinks of him. <laughs> he does not care at all. It's such an art form and a gift. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. It's, it, and it, and he does it. It's not premeditated. No, it's, it's not like plan. He doesn't sit down and write it out and plan it out. And like, this is what I'm going to say to these guys today. Now you put him in any situation and ask him a question that he has never heard before. He's going to give you the right answer. And it, it's, it's, he's the most unbelievable guy I've ever seen at being able to do that. Uh, and he, and he, obviously he, he was my coach for five years. Um, I, I got a lot of it. And I absorbed it all. Um, I feel like I gave him some too, but he gave me more. He gave me much, much more. Um, and I appreciate the hell out of him, man. Um, he, he changed He changed my career, changed the trajectory of my career, without a doubt. And obviously we're going to see him in, in chatting with the, the whole crew as well. Uh, oh, yeah, he'll be there. Hey, you've had a lot of huge plays. Obviously, big plays in the Super Bowl, big plays in playoffs against Philly. Uh, I mean, huge plays. Is there one that stands out more for you that you you lay your head on your pillow at night and that just lifts you up till today? Yeah, there, and there's it's actually it was towards the latter part of my career, to be honest with you. 
Um, obviously, the Philly play in, in the NFC Championship game is the one that everybody knows about. So it was biggest, but I was at my, you know, I was at my peak. It was coming off the year that I led the league in interceptions. Uh, it was that next year, and you know, I was in, I was playing my best ball. I, literally, I was at the peak, um, and I've stated that 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 peak ended up being a plateau for a lot more years. But there was a time, I think it was 08, um, when you talk about mental health, uh, when I was kind of down in the dumps, um, because I think I was 30, how old would I have been in 08? 33 years old. You know, I'd had a long career already. We just drafted a key, who we were talking about earlier, and the team wanted to replace me. They wanted to put a key in, in a game, and I was devastated. Um, you know, I'd had... And it wasn't to think, talk, thinking about starts, consecutive starts, all that stuff. But I had had like a, a long career and I was very well valued and uh, and viewed by a team and everybody else. In the middle of the season, they're thinking about starting this rookie over me. And uh, it didn't end up happening. Uh, that's, a, that's another very long story. But it didn't end up happening. And that next game, dude, we played Detroit and uh, I had a two interception game, one for a touchdown. And it was the second one that most stands out in my mind is the play that sprung board the latter, like the last four years of my career, because it was like, shit, this dude still has it. And it I'm was, not done. Right. Not done. Not even close to being done. Like it it was, them thinking like, done. Right. It was a comeback, which is a hard play to intercept. Uh, came off the loop that we call it. That's a technique. Came off the loop, stuck my foot in the ground, came, came and undercut this, this, this receiver. Dante Culpepper kind of laid it out to the sideline. I picked up a sweet pick too. I had to reach up and go get it and then scored. And it was like, okay, I'm I, that, there's that mental health, health crisis that I was having, that crisis of confidence that I was starting to have again, that, that shit's gone. And uh, it, I played four more years after that. And it was pretty, pretty, pretty powerful moment for me still um, that I like to share with a lot with people about, you know, that, that perseverance and finding ways you know, to force your will on your opponent, right? To force your will on a situation. And uh, it, it happened right for me that day. It's also, look, it's a gift. You taught yourself to not labor, label yourself what everybody else was labeling you as, which your whole career has kind of been it, right? Yeah. Everybody is always, how do you, how are you able to do that? Not let people define you, but you have been able to define yourself, yeah. despite how they describe you. Yeah, that's exactly, it's actually kind of the message of my Hall of Fame speech, to be honest with you, Jay, uh, you know, because there's a lot of people out there, whether they uh, just didn't care to know what, how, what I was or undervalued me or whatever, um, those voices you have to realize aren't your own, because um, it's easy to let them be your own, either if they're doing, they're so loud and they're so, like, let's make a judgment on Jay Glazer. Jay Glazer, there's no way Jay Glazer is going to be a, the, the most prominent uh 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 uh, scoop breaker (laughs) now i'm not calling it an insider that's not you you're not an insider (laughs) all those other fuckers are insiders you're 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 the scoopage king right how am i going to define myself jay glazer as being a scoopage king it was the same thing how can i let what other people's voices are saying define me and you just choose not if you choose not to you, you open up yourself the possibility to be whatever you want to be. And uh, I, I don't know where that came from, L- largely because I knew that I wasn't going to be a failure. I wasn't going to allow myself to be that. Um, uh, I had destined in my mind to be something better than that, than what they expected of me. And uh, at the end of the day, that was that was all I needed. And it, it helps being good at your craft and you know having a mentality that allows you to get through it where th- those opinions don't bear you. Um, um, but over the course of a 16 year career, I proved a lot of people wrong. And that was, uh, that was at the end of the day. Now that's very rewarding. Right. And this is the first time we've put it to words, but it is, it's one of the best talents or skills or whatever you want to say, one of the best qualities that you have had over the years, just not ever let anybody tell you who you are and you decide I'm going to make up who I am. It's just right. been incredible. It's been incredible for me to have a, a front row seat to it all. Um, my last question. I ask all my guests this. Give me a moment in your life that should have broken you, but didn't. 
And as a result, you came through the other side of that tunnel much stronger, hence unbreakable. And you can yeah. use that for the rest of your life. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, God, I have to think about that because there's probably been a couple. Uh, I, well, I, I know one very early in life. Um, um, I'm not even sure what age I was now. Uh, probably about 13. And we were a close-knit family. You know this. You know about my mom and my aunts. And and uh, I remember waking up one morning. My mom told me that uh, my her oldest sister, the one just below my mom, my mom's the oldest, uh, was killed, murdered. And that moment was, was the first time in my life that I had had felt lost like that. Um, you know, Brief. old people die, you know, you, you, you around enough old people, you know, they're going to pass away. You expect it. This was unexpected. And I, I don't know that, that it, that it so much changed me, but it jaded me. And it, it gave me this realization that it's fragile. You know, life is fragile. We were young, dude. Tegan and I were very young. I, I want to say we were 12 and I should know this, this year, but I, it's blanking on me right now. But the reality was um, it, it easily could have broke us. It could have broke our family, uh, but it didn't. Um, we persevered through it. Um, we found a way to make ourselves uh, adjust to the grief and just to the loss. And I think, and I use that word jaded because nothing else could be more important than losing a loved one. And, and at the end of the day, uh, Whatever happened, uh, we made it through that, so we right. can make it through anything. That was your first real sign of grief, right? And, how you and not knowing how to deal with it, it too. I mean, I watched my mom deal with it, and my grandmother deal with it, and my other two aunts deal with it, and the the struggle that that really is. That is, that's un, it's it's unmarkable. You can't you can't say how it affects any one person. But grief is real. It's tough, man. And if you can get through the other side of it, there can be joy uh, and, and and revelations of uh, that life is precious. You just have to love it when you have it. Well, brother, I cannot wait to see you this week. I'm so excited to see you this week, man. And listen, I love when I'm proud when things happen for me that are really cool. But life is amazing when they happen to people that you love. And no nobody deserves just more than you, man. The hard work you put in, the hours and hours and hours and hours that I have witnessed, the injuries you played through, the just the grunt and and man, the, the tears that you spilt that no one else ever saw. I'm proud of you. Thanks, man. I love you, dude. Love you too. There for me. It's gonna be uh, <laughs> party. Will be fun afterwards too. Oh, it'll be great, man. <laughs> hey, and once again, thank you for answering my call that day, and clearing your schedule, telling me you'll be there for me because I think it changed the trajectory of a lot of people's lives. So was, I was able to talk about it. what happens when you call a friend saying I'm struggling. You were the first it. man and definitely not the last now. I love you, man. I'll always be there for you, brother. Always. Rondé Barber, Hall of Famer. Thank you, brother. Yeah, man.